In August of 1984, President Ronald Reagan said this in a speech. He said, we establish no religion in this country, nor will we ever. We command no worship. We mandate no belief. But we poison our society when we remove its theological underpinnings. Without God, there is a coarsening of the society. And without God, democracy will not and cannot endure. And here's the key. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. I think President Reagan's words nearly 40 years ago have proved to be somewhat prophetic. Because as you look to the State of the Union today, I think it's fair to say that our nation has gone under in many ways. So most certainly, our unity has gone under. We're angry, we're polarized, we're divided on virtually everything in this nation. Our economy has gone under, and we're worried, we're nervous, we're anxious about when will it actually turn back around. Our mental health has gone under. In fact, statistically, 60% of our nation is lonely. Millions are anxious. The nuclear family has gone under. The traditional core values have been questioned and even villainized. Families are broken and hurting. Likewise, sexual purity has gone under. And sexual deviancy has been celebrated all across our nation. There's so many things we could talk about how things have gone under, and Reagan said it would go under when we stopped living under the name and reign of God. It's interesting as you look to that phrase, under God, what does that even really mean? And a lot of people have debated that, but to me it's pretty simple. To be under God means you are under God. It's to humbly acknowledge that there is an authority that is higher than yourself, that there is someone who made us. There's a creator, and we are just his creation. And that there is a God, and we humbly need him. And what's interesting is Reagan said when we lose sight of that, that we need God, he said we will go under. And it'd be interesting and really easy, I might add, to write a sermon today to talk about all the wicked things our country is doing. In all the ways that the lost people are acting lost, in all the ways that our nation has gone under because of the world. But what's interesting is the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' sermon, which we are teaching in this series. In Jesus' sermon, he doesn't go after the lost, he actually goes after the religious. And what he's going to bring to our attention is something that's even a little bit more tragic, I would argue. It's not that the world isn't living under God, but Jesus is going to say today that sometimes religious people pretend to live under God, but they really are not. And that, I would argue, has had the most devastating impact on our country. And today, Jesus is going to speak to this idea of what does it mean, what does it look like if you live your life under God? And he's going to bring up three disciplines of giving, praying, and fasting. And my question for you to consider today is, are you living under God? Don't worry about the country. Are you living under God? Because I can guarantee you this, our country will not live under God until the church starts living under God first. And when we start to let God rule and reign over our lives, in all facets— that's when the land can actually change. So if you have your Bible, join me right there in Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to see this idea. As Jesus unpacks, what does that mean for each of us to live under God today? I'm going to read the entirety of this passage. Normally I read a little, talk a little. I'm going to read it all, and then we'll talk a lot. So we're going to change the rhythm today, starting in verse 1. Chapter 6, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. 
Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in secret. And your father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. Pray like this, then. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So in this passage, if you're new here, we're looking at Jesus' most famous sermon. It's the most famous sermon to ever be preached. And we were told in chapter 5, Jesus went up the mountain, and he's up on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. He's gone up this hillside, now known as the Mount of Beatitudes. And he takes the posture of a rabbi, he's seated, and he begins teaching for these three chapters in the Gospel of Matthew. And if you remember, it's reminiscent of Old Testament imagery. Moses went up a mountain, but why did he go up the mountain? We're told it was to receive the law. But Jesus in the New Testament goes up the mountain not to receive the law, but to reconstruct our understanding of the law. And Jesus starts teaching them things that they already know, but they're not actually practicing in their hearts. And he starts speaking to an idea of inner righteousness. Because what the law did is it led religious people to seek an outer righteousness that could be seen by others. But Jesus says God is far more concerned about the inner righteousness in your heart. Because if you get your heart right, the outward stuff will actually take care of itself. And Jesus starts to speak about these things that they had misunderstood. For instance, you remember in the fifth chapter, he brought up the sixth commandment and he started talking about murder. He said, you know, you're not supposed to murder someone, but he said, God has a problem when you hate someone in your heart. And then he brought up the seventh commandment. He said, you've heard you're not supposed to commit adultery, but God has a problem when you have this lust in your heart. Jesus says that God doesn't just want to clean up your behavior. He actually wants to clean up you. He wants to change your heart. He wants to transform you and change you from the inside, and that will impact what you do on the outside. So Jesus keeps going after all these outside things because if we're being honest, it's really easy to be pious. It's really easy easy to make a list of religious things and say, I checked every box, I'm doing great. And Jesus starts to deconstruct that understanding because he speaks there in the passage. He goes after three spiritual disciplines that are all good and great, but he explains that people are using them for the wrong reason. Because you remember in verse one, he said, beware of practicing your righteousness before other be people. Why? in order to be seen. And Jesus talks about how giving and praying and fasting had been used for the wrong reasons. He talks about giving first, and he says, don't sound the trumpet when you give. 
And for the Jews, they all understood about giving because God had always commanded them to be generous. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God tells his people to be generous. And in the Old Testament, there was the offerings, there was the tithe, and there were alms, gifts to the poor. And Jesus says, you're giving, that's great. But he said, when you give, don't sound the trumpet. Don't bring all the attention to yourself because if you're doing that, why are you giving? It's actually so you can receive. And Jesus says, if you're doing it to receive, then are you actually even giving? And this is a problem we still have with in the 21st century. I'll give, but I'll only give if my name is on that project. I'll give, but only so I can get in those social philanthropy circles. I'll give and be generous, but really it's so I can exercise power over that institution or that church or even that family member. Sometimes we do the right things for the wrong reasons. And Jesus said, I can see through it. Then he brings up praying which praying is so important. It's central to our spiritual lives in the Old Testament and the New. It's communing with God. It's aligning ourselves to him and who he is and his will for our lives. But Jesus says some religious people have hijacked that too. Because he talks about how in that day there were those who loved to stand in synagogues, the public gathering. And they loved to use big words in prayers. They loved people to stare at them and look at them. He said there's others that would actually stop on the street because what would happen is the Jews, many of them would pray three times a day. So if they were traveling, they would just stop where they are and they'd start praying publicly. And I need to be clear, Jesus is not saying public prayer is bad. In fact, Jesus prayed publicly himself. And in fact, Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he tells Timothy that the church should pray publicly when gathered together. But Jesus is against insincere public prayers. And he's against public prayers that never actually lead to private prayers. Jesus says there's something wrong with us if the only time we'll actually pray is when we're in front of other people, but we never talk to God for the next six days. He said, something's wrong with us. He said, something is wrong when we only want to pray with big words and it turns into a speech so people can think we're so pious and well-versed in Scripture, but we never come to the Lord quietly in his presence. He says, there's problems when we start faking our prayers. When we'll pray three meals a day and restaurants to be seen, but we'll never actually pray in our prayer closet at home. Jesus says, you're missing it. And he brings up this third one, fasting. Which fasting, I'll admit, is one that we're not really well versed in in the 21st century. Maybe intermittent fasting, I've done that for a physical diet, but spiritual fasting is one that's not exercised often. But what is fasting? Fasting is abstaining from food for a spiritual purpose. It's neglecting the physical nourishment for a short period of time to go seek God for more spiritual nourishment. And it's interesting that especially as Baptists, I'll be honest, we're great on feasting, we're not very good on fasting. We are the denomination of donuts and potlucks, yes and amen, and we love it. There's nothing wrong with that. I hope you enjoy your donut holes when you leave here today. There's nothing wrong with feasting, but when's the last time you fasted? Because Jesus brings up this idea of fasting, and it's not his idea. It's all throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, if you think about it, it's exercised by virtually everyone on the who's who list. Moses fasted. David fasted. Elijah fasted, Daniel fasted, Esther fasted. You go to the New Testament, uh, Paul fasted. In the book of Acts, the early church fasted. And even Jesus himself fasted. He's not against fasting, but what he's against is insincere fasting. Because what happened in Luke chapter 18, we're told Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees at that day. They were fasting as much as two times a week. And it's worth noting this, that in the law in the Old Testament, there's only one command for the fast to be exercised regularly and publicly. That was on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 23. 
But all the other fasting oftentimes was drawn in spontaneous moments over course of time in history. But the Pharisees started doing it two times a week. And why did they do it? It wasn't because they were hungry for God. It's because they were hungry for attention. They wanted people to look at them, say how pious they are. That's why they disfigured their faces so others would know how religious they are. And what Jesus is saying in all of this is he can see it all. He can see through it all. And Jesus is not saying that praying, giving, fasting are bad things, but he's saying you can do the right things for the wrong reasons. And what he's really telling us today is this first point. Jesus wants sincere faith. Jesus wants sincere faith. That's why he called them hypocrites, if you caught it. He said, don't be like the hypocrites. He says it three times. What, what is a hypocrite? In the Greek, the word is hypocrites. And that word hypocrites is where we get hypocrite. But hypocrites was actually used to talk about actors. If you study that word, it was used to note actors in Greek times. And what, how did actors act? Still to this day, sometimes they put on masks. They put on a mask to hide themselves and pretend to be something that they're not. And Jesus says, don't be that person with a mask. It's interesting, when I came to start pastoring here at ABC almost three years ago to the day, I came at an interesting time where the church was wearing masks. Not spiritual masks, but physical mask because I came at the height of COVID, right, as it was raging through in the first waves. And I remember for that first year, year and a half, there were masks everywhere, just like they were everywhere in culture. And can I just confess something to you? For my first year to year and a half, I didn't know who any of you were. I really didn't. I didn't know any of you. I had no idea who I was talking to. You might have been a first-time visitor. You might have been here for 10 years. I didn't really know the difference because there was a mask. I couldn't see who was in front of me for a solid year. But what Jesus just said is, he can see through our masks. He sees through them. And he knows exactly who you are. He knows when you're singing the songs out of just religious obligation, but he knows when you're singing the songs out of humble adoration. He knows when you're listening to a sermon because you got dragged to church. And he knows when you're actually listening to the sermon because you want to hear God's voice. He knows when you're giving because you want to give an offering to the one who gave you everything. And he knows when you're giving just to seek power and control. He knows why we do what we do. He sees everything. And the crazy part is, he still loves us. He still loves you. Because some in this room, I would argue most likely you've been wearing a spiritual mask for a long time and God already knows and sees that and sees all of the deception that you're not really under God, you're just playing games with God and he still loves you. He still loves you. In fact, Romans chapter two, verse four says it's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. You see, that's why we should have a sincere faith, that God actually sees through all of it and he still wants you around just like he wants me. And what should that lead us to? Worship. It should lead us to worship. It should lead us to sincere giving, that Lord, I'm giving this with no motivation other than to bring honor to you. Lord, I am praying not with an agenda, but because I wanna be aligned to your agenda for my life. Lord, I'm fasting not just so I can feel good and great about myself, but because I need more of you in my presence. These are the reasons why we do these spiritual disciplines. We do them to bring honor to God from a sincere place in our heart. And my question for you to consider today is, are you living under God? Are you actually exercising a sincere faith? Or are you walking around with a mask before God? If so, Jesus would say, take it off. Take it off, because he already sees what's under, and he loves you, and he says, let that love bring you back to a sincere place with him. 
Jesus wants a sincere faith, but what he tells us in this passage is our second point as well. Jesus also wants a committed faith. He wants sincerity from us, that we respond and worship for who he is and what he's done, but he wants commitment from us. And this is what I mean by that. In verse 2, he said, when you give. In verse 5, he said, when you pray. In verse 16, he said, when you fast. You see, Jesus actually said, I expect you to do these things. He said, I'm not telling you to throw the baby out with the bathwater. He says, these are good things. He says, this is actually stuff that God had invented and told us is good for our souls. He doesn't say, stop doing these things. He says, just do them with the right heart. He expects us to be committed to him. He said, when you give, he's expecting us to give. He says, when you pray, he's expecting us to pray. When you fast, he's expecting you to fast. Jesus wants commitment from us. And what I've noticed, especially in the 21st century amongst, I will say, people of my own generation and the younger generation in particular, many people have abandoned the spiritual disciplines. These are just three of many we could go down the list on. But we don't give, pray, fast. And why? We would argue is because of hypocrites. How ironic is that? We would say it was because of hypocrites of former generations. In my generation, this is what many say. They got fed up with cultural Christianity, so they don't want to be a part of any form of Christianity, and now they're just spiritual people. And Jesus just said, nonsense, nonsense. He said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, he says, you are a part of his body, and he expects us to do these things as his people. The question then is, why? Why does he expect us? to do these things. And I just want to first say this. It's not because he needs anything from you or me. He doesn't need us to give him something because he's out of stuff. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Job said, Lord, you give and you take away. It's all his already. He doesn't say give because I'm in need. He doesn't say pray because he's lonely. It's God himself in perfect triune community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's all-sufficient, all-powerful, omnipotent. He has no need. He doesn't say fast because I just want to watch you squirm. He doesn't need anything from us. So then why does he tell us to do these things? I'm going to give you two reasons. The first is this. We need these things. We need these things. That's why he tells you to do it. We need to give, we need to pray, we need to fast. Because when we give, pray, and fast, what does that do? It helps us remember we're under God. When you start giving, you start remembering that this all came from him. When you start praying, you start remembering, God, I need your wisdom and your grace. When you start fasting, you start remembering that, Lord, I need the living bread more than any physical bread. That these things realign us to who God is and his will for our life. We need these things. And that's why he tells us to do them. But then secondly, I will tell you this. Why does he call us to do it? It's because the world needs us to do these things. The world needs us to do these things. I would contend America would look a lot different if God's people started actually being generous and praying and fasting. Maybe part of our problem in this country is not just that the world keeps acting lost. Maybe part of our problem is that the saved aren't acting saved. We're not doing what God called us to do. But when we start praying and giving and fasting, what America starts to see is actually authentic Christianity. That's why our third core value here at ABC is authenticity. We believe the world needs to see an authentic faith that is sincere. And when we start doing these things, they actually make an impact on the world that is watching. I went to an event, this was about a month ago, two months ago, some of y'all were at it, It was a national day of prayer event. It was the governor's prayer breakfast. And I went in there, and every year this is an event full of religious folks, religious politicians, but also just church members, nonprofits, et cetera. And the governor's there as well. 
And there's always a keynote speaker. The keynote speaker that morning was a guy named Nick Vujicic. And Nick Vujicic is, he's a, uh, he's a international evangelist speaker, motivational speaker. He has no limbs, no arms, no legs, and a remarkable story. But he has a voice as big as a lion's. And he started preaching in that room. And he was preaching to a room full of pious people, including myself. And he got up there, and I remember he looked at Governor Abbott, who was just a few feet from him on the stage, and he looked at the governor with, with tears welling up in his eyes. He said, Governor, I just want you to know, I didn't vote for you, but I do fast for you. He said, I fast for you, because I know what you're going through. I know how difficult it is to be in your shoes. And as he's saying this, how he fasts and prays over him and our country, you have a room full of religious folks just like me thinking, when's the last time I actually fasted for my government? When's the last time I actually prayed deliberately, anxiously, with angst in my soul for the people who lead us? Because if I'm just going to be candid, you know what we usually do? We don't fast, we just complain. We complain. And we point fingers. But we never point the finger back to ourselves. Because maybe if America would start praying, fasting, and being generous, if God's people in America rather would do these things, maybe America would actually start to look different. That's why it convicted me in my heart that maybe we should do something here at ABC. That maybe we need to have some time of prayer and fasting. Because fasting in the Old Testament was used, I told you, on the Day of Atonement, but also if you study Scripture, fasts were called by leaders of Israel for specific moments of national catastrophe. When things were going awful, God's leaders, kings and prophets, they would call Israel to fast. They would say, it's time to fast. In fact, Joel, one of the famous prophets, people debate over when he wrote that prophecy but most likely it was after the first wave of exile, and things were going awful for Israel, if you don't know the story. They had so much wickedness in their lives. They were acting like pagans, completely lost, doing horrible things. God disciplined them, sent them off into exile, into a foreign land, and the prophet Joel has a prophecy and the Lord starts to speak to him as the nation is in distress, that they've gone the wrong way, and all the wrong choices are leading to this catastrophic place. The prophet Joel spoke this prophecy in chapter 2. We're told, Yet even now, declares the Lord through the prophet, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord, your God. He said, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. He said, return to the Lord. And notice he said, rend your heart, not your garments. He said, give God your heart, not all the other stuff. He says, give him the internal. He says, give him your heart and return with fasting, weeping, and mourning. He said, in hopes that God might heal the land. And what he said to bring this to their attention, he said, blow the trumpet in Zion. In other words, sound the alarm. Sound the alarm to the nation that if we don't start doing what God actually already told us to do, then it's just going to get worse. That's what Joel said. So he said, blow the trumpet and call the people to fast. And this morning, I'm blowing the trumpet and I'm calling you to fast. In your chair, you're going to see something. It's a little handout here. We'll put it online as well. Y'all can share them. But we're going to do something the next two days. We're going to be calling it Fast on the 3rd, Feast on the 4th. Feast on the 4th will be easy. That will not be a problem. Fasting on the 3rd may be a challenge. 
What I'm going to ask our church to do tomorrow is to begin fasting for 24 hours. For some of you, maybe just fast one meal. If you've never done it before, if you have health ailments, modify it to whatever you need to do for your own life. But I encourage you fast, whether that's one meal, two meals, three meals. But the purpose of the fast is to say no to the physical food, but then to say yes to the spiritual food, to spend that time with the Lord in prayer and in meditation over his word. To help guide you in that process, there's some scripture there that you can meditate on tomorrow. On the back side, there are specific things you can pray for along with scripture that you can pray over those offices and positions in our nation. And then on the fourth, after we fasted on the third, we will feast on the fourth because feasting is also an idea that comes from scripture. Feasting is a sign of celebration. And did you know that's actually a spiritual discipline as well is celebration. And it's good to celebrate what God has done. So on the fourth, we will celebrate the freedom that God has given our nation. We will never become entitled to that in this church. That God has granted us freedom that so many countries are right now dying for. But God's already given it to us, and we're going to celebrate that and thank God for it. And thank God for those who have fought to protect it. But we're also going to be celebrating on the fourth the freedom that Jesus Christ has given us. Jesus Christ has already emancipated us from sin and death. He's freed us spiritually, and one day he will return as our triumphant king, so we pledge our allegiance to him on the fourth, and we celebrate that reality that Jesus is king. So I encourage you, for these next 48 hours, don't just learn about giving, be generous. Don't just learn about praying, pray. And don't just hear some words about fasting, fast. Because if we do the things that God's called us to do, there is hope as I close with this verse. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, this is what God tells Israel. He says, if my people, the ones who belong to him, who were called by my name, humble themselves and pray to seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If we want God to heal our land, you better humble yourself, he said. You better repent of sin, he said. And you better pray and fast and you ask God, I return to you, will you return to our land so we can see healing in America? God will never, ever, ever bring a revival into this world, he says, unless it starts right here with his people. If we want our nation to live under God, then you better live under God this week.